So hello and welcome to another episode of Top 10s. I'm your host of this episode, Carl Smallwood. If you don't believe that's my last name, you can check the social media you know, link below to confirm it for yourself. And today we're having another episode in our new format that we're trialing. That being where we ask a member of you, our lovely audience at home, to submit a question to us to then pass on to a member of our writing team to answer in our own signature listicle style. And today the question we're answering is, can the humans really colonize Mars and how difficult would it be if we could? And since we're talking about Mars, it makes sense to make my set match the occasion. Yeah. So in 2004, then President Bush was expected to make a pretty bold announcement for a new space initiative. That being that there will be a manned mission to Mars and a planned moon base by 2020. Better crack on then. The estimated cost of this was between 40 and 80 billion dollars. A later, better estimate stated that this would probably cost closer to half a trillion dollars. One proposed plan to save money was that they were going to use older astronauts so they'd only have to do one trip. You know, because it costs less to send people one way than it does to, you know, plan for them to return. NASA conducted over 1,000 studies on potential Mars missions between 1950 and 2000 alone, and at one point NASA was actively looking at having a manned mission to Mars, or inexplicably, Venus in the 1970s. For anyone who doesn't know why that'd be stupid, it basically just rains acid 24-7 on the surface of Venus. You don't want to go there. Obviously, humanity is not moving all that quickly towards Mars, but it will happen one day, maybe? And when it does, is it just going to be a quick trip or something more? It's almost a waste of resources just to go there to plant a flag, though that would be kind of cool. The idea of setting up a base and even colonising the planet has long been a dream. For example, Elon Musk has a plan to get there and populate the planet by 2040 seemingly entirely by himself. He believes one million people will be living there by then. NASA, you know, with all the people who work at NASA and all the scientists and stuff like that, estimate that this is a bit optimistic and state that by the 2040s a manned mission might be possible, though moon bases and people living on Mars and creating little Martian babies is a little far-fetched. Well, the question is, can we even do this at all? And if we could, how many obstacles are there? How do we overcome them? How do we populate Mars and, you know, get some people living there? It's far harder than populating some random part of the Earth, even one that is generally inhospitable because at least the cost of getting there is not half a trillion dollars. The problems are numerous. For example, the atmosphere on Mars is thin and inhospitable, about 95% carbon dioxide, the thing you can't breathe. The pressure is also really low. That, so low, in fact, that without the protective gear you need to wear, your blood would boil within your skin. Mars did used to have a magnetic field like the Earth's, but it phased away about four billion years ago, give or take, you know, a couple million years. That means it's no longer able to hold an Earth-like gravity because the solar winds stripped it all away. Not that it matters because the gravity on the planet is about 38% that of Earth's and thus any thick atmosphere is not possible. It just floats away. Which is weird, right? The atmosphere floating away into space and then anything that doesn't is just stripped away by wind from space. So there's no real atmosphere on Mars because the wind took it. There is water on Mars, admittedly, but it's not free-flowing, at least as far as we know. We don't know what's under the surface, and we'd have to land near some of that to, to harvest it. Likewise, growing plants on Mars in Martian soil would require resources to work and then harvest it. Likewise, growing plants on Mars would require some special conditions. You can't just plant a potato in Martian soil, as Matt Damon has shown us. The planet is also far colder than Earth. It is further away from the sun after all, with temperatures only getting as high as about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but plunging as low as minus 80. 80 degrees. It also gets far less light to aid in photosynthesis, you know, further away from the sun and all that. Plants will need to be grown in greenhouses, which would require yet more resources and care. Most concerning is that because Mars has no atmospheric shielding like Earth, it's constantly been bombarded by cosmic radiation, which is bad. Anyone on the surface of Mars without proper shielding would be constantly being bombarded by this energy and would be at risk of things like cancer and other diseases that aren't cancer. That's a problem that needs to be solved before any long-term settlements can be established. Otherwise, all the settlements will be filled with people with cancer. And that's not, a, you know, a, a new Mars colony. That's a hospice. So how do we solve these problems? Luckily for us, and lucky for the first people that go to Mars, we do have a few solutions proposed, though not all of them are viable. First of all, let's start with building shelter. Before anything can happen on Mars, it needs to have a place to happen. Humans on Mars will need shelter. SpaceX has been working on plans for dome shelters for some time now, but the problem with building them is that humans can't just bring lumber or concrete. There are only so many heavy supplies that a space shuttle can take. 
One idea is for Martian shelters to be made of chitin. You can find this material in fungus as well as exoskeletons of insects and things like fish or lizard scales. Astronauts could theoretically bring insects of protein and then extract the chitin, mix it with Martian soil to make a construction material. Using only materials found on Mars or that are byproducts of things that the astronauts brought, could result in a compound that is very much like concrete, but much lighter. And a positive of using chitin is that not only can you make building materials out of it, you can also fashion it into just about anything, even tools. It's sturdy, it's lightweight, and it's easy to make. It just so happens to be made of bugs. Other plans submitted to NASA include making use of 3D printing, specifically getting giant 3D printers that they send ahead of time and then get robots to use to build the structure ahead of time, so when the astronauts land, there's already a house there. Taking advantage of Martian geography is also an option, and there's one thing that has been proposed. Why go to all the hard work of building a shelter when you can just go live in a cave? Back to the basics for humanity, I suppose. And there are several caves that have been identified on Mars as potential sites where this could happen. In a similar vein, there's the idea of building underground, which could also be quite useful as a side effect of it would be that with the people living in them will be protected from. In a similar vein, the idea of building underground has been proposed. Subterranean structures would have the dual purpose of being really cool, who doesn't want to live on, like, you know, an underground bunker on Mars, but also will protect you from the cosmic radiation mentioned earlier. All of these have been proposed, though it's not clear which of them, if any, would be viable. Let's move on, though, to producing oxygen. Humans kind of need oxygen to live. It's something we can only live for for about three minutes. So without it, the first trip to Mars would be a relatively short one. And the oxygen tanks on a space shuttle weigh about 1.3 million pounds. And that's just the oxygen that they need for survival and travel, plus a little bit extra in case anything goes wrong. There's not really any room for stuff they would need when they're on Mars just enough to get them established and start making their own. So how would they go about that? Well, NASA has created a machine called a MOXIE, the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment that extracts oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. They tested this on the Perseverance rover and it proved successful throughout many tests. The machine strips molecules away from the CO2 in the Martian atmosphere to make breathable oxygen by the way of electrolysis. This oxygen could also be used as fuel, so win-win. In the test, it did make enough air for a small dog to survive. So, dogs on Mars, let's go. In reality, more powerful machines could theoretically be deployed to ensure all the astronauts have air to breathe for the duration of their stay, in addition to their small dogs. There are, of course, other ways to potentially make breathable air on Mars, though. One is that if the briny water full of chemicals called perchlorates found on Mars probes is an indication of more abundant water supplies, astronauts could land on Mars near these rivers, which are frozen, but, you know, that's a problem they can deal with at the time, extract the abundant oxygen and hydrogen from the solution, also using electrolysis, this would make oxygen, and also by using less power. A third method involves doing pretty much what the MOXIE machine does, however, instead of using electrolysis, they use low temperature plasma instead, which would be far more fuel efficient. Assuming that air is not going to be an issue if one of these things is solved and scaled up in a way that is suitable, what do we do about food and water? Well. Mars has an abundance of ice, this much we know, and it's on the surface and below it, so water would be fine, you'd think. Because ice is just water, right? Well, not exactly. The ice could be used to make drinkable water, but the water is toxic, so it would need to be treated before consumption. But NASA does have plans for that. One includes introducing helpful bacteria to consume the dangerous perchlorates that make the water undrinkable. So, already... So let's just, let's just start counting them now, ideas for introduce weird new bacteria to the alien planet. Of course, it's like, you no know, bacteria that exists here on Earth, but think of it from, like, you know, Mars's perspective. It's alien bacteria that it doesn't understand, that is not suited for that environment, but hey-ho, human's gone a human. To make water for a whole colony, though, ideas include making a giant microwave water extractor that can operate inside a borehole in the ice, which potentially could make as much water as people need. Once the water solution has been handled, astronauts can move on to worrying about how to grow food. The Martian soil is fairly toxic, so things like hydroponic gardens are going to be the solution, hydroponic being grown entirely in water. But that doesn't mean the soil has no use. Cyanobacteria could be used to grow Martian soil. This will remove the dangerous perchlorates mentioned and provide organic materials required for farming. Essentially, it would make fertilizer in which the astronauts could then grow their food. So that's another just weird bit of alien bacteria we want to take to Mars. 
With fertiliser provided by bacteria or even human waste, a la Matt Damon in The Martian, farms could exist in Martian structures, hydroponic gardens, vertical farms, or anything that offers space to grow plants could be used. While it seems like it might be hard to grow plants on an inhospitable planet, agricultural experts have likened it to growing crops in a city. It may not be set up in a way that is conducive to that, but you can adapt. That's what plants and humans do. As a bonus, the plants could also be used as part of the water recycling programs and to produce oxygen, much like they are here on Earth. Although we are trying to, you know, stop that as quickly as we can. Yeah. NASA is also working on genetically modified plants that could be better adapted and suited for Mars's harsh environment in the hopes of boosting food and oxygen production. These plants could even be used to make medicine, because there's only a limited amount of that you can fit onto a spaceship. But what about radiation? Well, so theoretically we can get to Mars, build a base, fill it with oxygen, grow some salads while we're at it. What do we do about the dangerous radiation bombarding the planet 24-7? Well, it's estimated that an astronaut heading to Mars will be expected to encounter radiation levels 700 times higher than that on Earth. Particle radiation, the most dangerous type, comes from distant stars and is made of protons, stripped of their electrons and travelling at near light speed. Most are hydrogen, but some are much heavier elements like iron or uranium. Spoilers, you don't want this like just flying directly into your eyeballs. These particles pass through near enough everything that they hit, including spacecraft and the astronauts inside them. On their way through your body they can damage DNA and cells. You can shield against them with very thick lead for instance, but that's impossible to take to Mars. It just weighs too much. Other options may include using something like hydrogen in the form of water or plastics. So that's another one. So weird alien bacteria and now microplastics! Microplastics on Mars, let's go. Another option is hydrogenated boron nitrate nanotubes, which are light enough to be woven into fabric. More work is required, though, to determine the feasibility of that. One more potential method to protect astronauts from these dangerous particles is to basically create a sort of force field, which sounds like science fiction, but it's actually a lot simpler than it sounds. Effectively, just create a giant magnetic field. Mars doesn't have its own, and humans are capable of creating one. They could do so with superconducting electromagnets set up around a Martian base that would stop the particles. The problem with this is that the power requirements to operate such a superconducting magnet are just not feasible. Though it is an idea if we are able to scale up the technology or invent something that would power it that is far more efficient. So far, coming up with a practical way to overcome the radiation is an issue that's proven to be one of the most difficult missions to get to Mars. There are some solutions, but it's not known how effective they would be over the long term, which is pretty much a requirement, given that the idea would be to send the astronauts there for the rest of their lives. And if they can't be protected from the radiation, those lives would be short, miserable, and probably end with them dying of cancer which is hardly the end we'd imagine for the first people to set foot on Mars. But here's a question, can we terraform Mars? Thanks to science fiction, the idea of terraforming something is something many of us are aware of, but the logistics are really, really not all that well understood. No one has ever done it before or even began to try, so we're kind of flying blind on a lot of this and there are major hurdles to overcome. If you want to terraform Mars, it does need an atmosphere. How do you provide that if nothing holds the atmosphere in place? Escape velocity on Mars is three miles per hour, so it's very hard to keep anything bound to the planet. As mentioned, any atmosphere that Mars once had simply blew away into space. One plan to make Mars hospitable involves releasing iron and aluminium nanorods into the atmosphere, creating the equivalent of greenhouse gases to melt the polar ice caps. Yet, yeah, the idea to make Mars hospitable is to do the same thing we're doing to Earth that is currently making it inhospitable. Isn't science fun? This would take years and would only make the planet slightly warm. It wouldn't make the soil usable, but remember, we have plans for that. To make oxygen on Mars would be a monumental, if not near impossible, task. On Earth, cyanobacteria evolved billions of years ago when our own atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide, so why don't we take some of that? Well, you know, they did began performing photosynthesis to produce oxygen and made our world hospitable for life. That could theoretically happen on Mars, but the process takes thousands upon thousands of years and would need brighter light than Mars has. To counter this, some low-light bacteria alternatives have been suggested, but none of them seem feasible. Melting ice caps on Mars might produce water, but it would not provide atmospheric pressure needed to allow liquid water to remain on the surface. And even if we did melt the ice caps on Mars, it may not provide enough atmospheric pressure for liquid water to remain on the surface, even if we use nuclear weapons to melt them, as some have proposed. So let's count them up. Two kinds of weird alien bacteria, microplastics, 
greenhouse gases, and now nuclear weapons. It's believed that there is simply not enough CO2 on Mars for any of this to work. The simple fact of the matter is the lack of any magnetic field means that any atmosphere we make will simply vanish again like a fart into the solar winds. That means either kickstarting the magnetic core of the planet again, which is beyond any known technology that exists, or establishing an artificial magnetic field to encompass all of Mars. But that's also beyond our current understanding of the technology we have. It's simply not feasible. If Mars could be terraformed, the process could very well take generations. Those who live there would have to adapt to a world with very different pressures and gravity to that on Earth. Daily exercise would be required just to maintain muscle and bone density. Otherwise, you would just collapse into a, a pile of skeleton goo with, with cancer. Sounds like it sucks. Also, you got to eat poop potatoes. There's no sun, so you'd be pale. So you'd like this. Not great, right? Over time, those on Mars would potentially adapt to the world and, as a result, would likely never be able to return to Earth without serious health issues. But none of that really matters at the moment because almost none of the technology needed to properly terraform Mars exists. We can go there and build, yes, but living on the planet's surface is something we'll not see for centuries, if ever. So thank you for watching. Hopefully everyone out there found this video to be entertaining, educational and informative. If you found the video to be any of those things, you can like, you know, give the author the script, Ian Forty, a follow and a like on social media found below. If you're enjoying this format, again, leave a like, comment if you've got some suggestions for other questions we can answer, or just with general feedback. You can subscribe for more content like this. And I have been your host, Carl Smallwood. And now I'm going to just flick through my options for background lighting. So red, green, this is what I use when I'm making fact theme videos. That's the other channel that I run. I've got blue. I like this blue, but it seems a bit basic. I've got purple, if you want to get fancy with it. Um, orange, I guess. Like you know, during winter, it makes it feel like there's a fire in here when I, like, you know, get the windows open and stuff. There's light blue. I like this. It's like mint blue. It makes me feel like I'm in a toothpaste commercial. Yellow. Again, it's warming, but doesn't really do much for me. And then pink. I also have these options. I can like go th smoothly go through them. Like red and green, red and blue. There's a strobe light effect that sucks. Just makes it look like the fire alarm's going off in my house. There's colourful flash. Again, not very good. There's colourful smooth. And I could turn it off. Which generally is what happens when I show people this. They also get turned off and asked to leave. Cheers!